the part that I usually find somewhat dangerous, like some of the bigger lines that you really got to be paying attention. We were actually just in the lower zone and it was rock hard. Like, it, like you couldn't even dig an edge in. Like we could have used crampons basically moving up mm. and we are making our way up, kind of up this gut gully. Uh, and it was me and my partner. And then we were about 10 feet from kind of cresting the top. And that kind of like convex area, it holds a lot of pressure with snow. And basically all of a sudden we just heard this terrible whoomph noise. And this crack shot out kind of about eight feet in front of me on top of me and then shot about 150 feet across. And I just yelled, start swimming. And the whole slope that had been like fully, you know, like rock hard, barely you could walk up with like, you know, boots on, uh, just turned into almost like a water like substance. And we you just threw you right on your feet and we were just swimming like crazy to stay on top of it. And I was able to grab some rocks. Uh, kind of near the top because it actually uh, slid all the way down to ground level and so I was able to grab some rocks about 50 feet um, down the avalanche like kind of been able to swim out of the top and that was probably four or five seconds and I turned around and my partner was already 400 feet down the mountain being taken down and so she got really lucky because the avalanche took this big bend um, and she got kind of shot out of the side and so she didn't end up getting taken down into the trees and there was quite the carnage in the trees. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty terrifying experience in the mountains. And she, she dislocated her shoulder swimming, trying to just swimming so hard to stay above it. And it's so interesting because obviously today we're focused on a film where like the mountains bring me so much healing and so much enjoyment. But that was one of those days where it can bring you so much humility and so much fear. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I was re-watching Rutsu and looking at when the, where you're up on the top of the crest of the mountain and some of those down, the filming of coming down, and I thought to myself, oh, I, about avalanches. And I was wondering if you had any word or concern about avalanches when you were doing that filming, because that was in Japan, right? Yeah, there's definitely always the concern, um, but I hadn't, I hadn't this, was, this winter was the first ever experience I've had. Uh, of an avalanche like that. So. Um, I'm going to stop your questioning because I, you're supposed to save those questions at the end of the discussion. And you're, you're asking questions I was supposed to ask. <laughs> you guys, are, I was going to ask the avalanche because I think it's on everybody's mind. It was like, <laughs> oh God. but thankfully, I still have questions to ask. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, be prepared, uh, Tamil, because everybody's going to go at you with all the questions. Uh, <laughs> but but oh Tamiko God. and I, we got to ask questions first. Well, I'm going to start. We got uh, right now a total of 23 people locked on. And um, uh, so I'm going to welcome everyone here, the, uh, Tamil, for being uh, our guest. And, um, uh, also all of you participants and then all the tech people that are helping out and people who make the connection. And thank you, Tamiko, for, for getting uh, uh, Tamo to be here and then sharing his film and just sharing his experience with us. Um, I'm gonna make the land acknowledgement at the same time, if I, you're not uh, in Vancouver, I want you to take a moment to be aware of the land that you're on and um, um, we gratefully acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. And we give thanks to the Musqueams, Squamish, and the Suela Tooth um, nations in Vancouver. And we'd like to thank the Vancouver Unitarians for supporting the formation of our BIPOC group and then wholeheartedly backing our celebration of Asian Heritage Month. And I had assumed everybody is from UCV, but if not, from our website, our beliefs are diverse and inclusive. We have no shared creed. Our shared covenant supports the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We are called to action around racial justice within our congregation, ourselves, and in collaboration with our community. Please be advised that uh, we will be recording this session as we hope to post it on the Vancouver Unitarian YouTube channel.
However, you have the option to turn off your camera, uh, which is at the bottom left corner. Uh, there's a stop video. If you click on that, you'll be able to turn off your camera. Um, you're invited to write down your questions <laughs> in the chat box, or once we start a Q&A session, click on the question uh, button, or you can click on the raise hand if you have a question to ask, and it will take turn. Our recorder uh, will be um, recording who first. Um, last week, we were very happy to have uh, Lynn Armstrong, the president of uh, the social justice, join to help us with the Q&A session. Tonight, we have Cindy Cashin from the Congregational Decision-Making Task Force and the Environment Team, and she will be our tech support tonight. I don't know if I got it all no, right. He was the tech support for the action evening. And she'll be doing the Q&A with us. Ah, thank you. I, um, next week is our last, last Friday series, film series. And uh, it was uh, Cynthia Lam who curated, curated all this uh, uh, Friday. Uh, it's an Asian comedy night. And the discussion will be on uh, racial stereotypes <laughs> and why some find it a source of humor and others puzzles. <laughs> okay, um, tonight our guest speaker is Tamil Campos. Um, he's my son, so that's why I have a little bit of a bias. He's a noted filmmaker and activist and has pa packed a lifetime of adventure and work into his 31 years of life. So as his mom, I had the privilege of taking part in the first 18 years where we hiked and skied the mountains of BC and backpacked in South America, Australia, and Indonesia. As a teenager, Tamil's snowboarding skills took him across North America and Chile to compete and film. And I think it was this adrenaline rush which helped him transition to activist work. He founded Beyond Boarding and it was his work there that introduced me to amazing people like Alex Morton and groups like the Klebona Keepers. Um, when he was arrested, I think because of a bit of racial uh, profiling on Burnaby Mountain about um, uh, Kinder Morgan, a group of us, 10 women, um, his fans, his family <laughs> and other friends crossed the line and got arrested in solidarity. And that was my introduction to a whole community of activists and activism. Currently, Tam was working on his master's at York University and at the same time working on a feature length film on the Klebona, keep, Klebona Keepers. He's living up in Iskut near the sacred headwaters and through the magic of Zoom can join us today. Okay, Mina has the first question. Yes, uh, um, <laughs> I better go it easy. <laughs> uh, there is so much we want to actually ask you, that you as the people were impatient to start asking before we <laughs> start of this uh, um, session. Um, what um, made you, uh, lead you to make this film, uh, Rusu? Right. Well, thanks, Mina and Mom, for that introduction. It's just an honor to be here. It's so great to see so many familiar faces from the Unitarian. I feel like we're just hanging out. At <laughs> Uh, in Vancouver. It's wonderful to see a lot of you. Um, and thanks for hosting um, this Zoom. And uh, next week sounds really exciting. I'm gonna have to tune into that as well. Um, yeah, so the background on Rootsu. I guess me and my sister would have been like a few years ago, actually really wanted to go to Japan and experience our roots there and connect there and put in time there because we had been very fortunate and privileged that our, our parents had taken us to Chile before. And I was able to see that side of my family, my dad being from Chile. And the connection was a lot more, I would say close because my dad actually immigrated from, from Chile. Uh, whereas my Japanese side was four generations ago. Um, and so it's something we always wanted to do. And when it finally kind of happened and we were planning this big trip uh, to Japan, I had a little more vacation time than my sister. So I had a whole month and a half before she was going to arrive. And obviously I had, you know, I'm a diehard snowboarder and Japan has some of the best powder in the whole world. 
I wanted to go ride the snowboard, <laughs> to snowboard in Japan and take my splitboard there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I've always been with my film work fascinated on how do you kind of blend genres uh, and bring in different stories and merge them together. And so when I decided I wanted to go snowboarding in Japan, I said, well, it'd be, not, you know, I'm going to be out there a month. Let's, let's think of a story that could work for this. Like, what's the narrative we could tell? How could we build a short film out of this? Uh, and I started to explore the idea that a lot of snowboard videos, you know, they're all about like going somewhere, like almost like this, like exploration to go see this like untapped area or this new mountain or this new place. But for me, it was almost like going to Japan to ride was in some ways coming home. Like this is going back to what's really inside of me. And there was a fascinating kind of story thread there that we were exploring a few months before going. Um, and so what we did was we came up with a short script of just kind of like basically going to Japan and kind of almost like a narrative journal exploring uh, what it would be like to go back to a place like that um, where your heritage is from. And, and we pitched it to CBC and they got back within an hour because they said that morning they were exploring, exploring ideas because the Tokyo Olympics were coming up and they were saying, how do we create some stories that blend sports with Japanese Canadian heritage? And so it just kind of worked out perfectly, um, that combination. Um, and they, we, because of my grandpa's longstanding relationship with CBC, they were really interested in bringing his character as well into the story. Uh, and with CBC, we kind of went back and forth and, and built this story um, and, you know, originally they were really keen on kind of telling this, like, you know, in their heads, it must have been like, oh, you have David Suzuki, this raging environmentalist. Obviously, he passed down this love of the natural world to his grandson, if he is an environmentalist act activist as well. And I really had to push back against that because, you know, and as you see in the film, it really was my parents that were the biggest role models uh, in getting me into the outside and making me fall in love with the natural world. Um, and really building the foundation of my environmental activism. And so, you know, as we went back and forth, we thought it was really neat that, that you know, that difference between the life, my politics of maybe my Chilean side and my Japanese side. And so we thought maybe that's a theme we could explore with this film that kind of makes it a little different than just a, to an envi intergenerational environmental family because, you know, my story is a little more complex than that. And so, yeah, that's kind of the, the background to the story and the, the, the genesis, genesis of Rutsu. So <clears throat> it wasn't covered at all in the film, but there's a whole other story that's in there that is very similar to last week's discussion where we had Howard and Wade Grant. Uh, Howard Grant, his father was Chinese and his mother was Musqueam. And after a whole lifetime, he finally decided that he would go to China to see where his father and his roots were from. And last year, when you were in Japan, you and your sister, almost by <laughs> fluke, found out where the family on my mom's side, uh, the, the grand, was it my grandfather, your great grandfather, where they lived. Do you want to tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, that story is wild. Sometimes when I retell this story, I think, Oh, I wish I was filming the second half of that, <laughs> that trip to Japan because we ended up after basically film Rutsu over the course of a month there, I left my splitboard in, in, in Tokyo and my sister flew in and we were able to get some, some cheap $80 bicycles there. And our plan was to bike all the way across Japan together over the course of a few months. Um, but COVID changed that and we got stuck in the Southern islands of uh, just North of Okinawa, small islands called Amami Oshima. And one of the places on our route that we really wanted to visit was this place called Sunagawa, uh, which is where my grandma's father's from. Uh, but the connection obviously had been lost a long, long time ago. And when COVID hit and we were stuck in this small town, we're like, well, I guess we're not going to make it there. Um, and we ended up being stuck for two and a half months in Amami with this small town of 60 people that took us in for two and a half months. It was, it was wild. And anyways, when we finally, when, when it opened up and we were able to fly home from Canada, uh, or sorry, from Japan, they, we had a two and a half week window basically to get to Tokyo. And we we're like, okay, we go, well, let's bike back up to Tokyo, but let's try to hit that Sunagawa area. Cause that's like, that's our roots on our mom's side. And so we, we get to the Sunagawa area and it's, it's basically like an, 
industrial farmland. Like, and it was 35 degrees, a hundred percent humidity. And we're biking by these big industrial greenhouses and, and just kind of biking through suffering a bit in the heat. And, and we're trying to talk to people to say like, cause we knew his name. That's all we knew was his name and just the district of Sunagawa, the small, uh, the small town. And so we'd be asking people like, what is the chances, you know, the Sunahadas like, uh, and then we'd say like, we are like um, his grandchildren. And because it's kind of like small town farming, we kind of have like a small town hick Japanese accent. And our act, and we struggled with Japanese, just normal Japanese. <laughs> and so, you know, we tried meeting the first couple of people, no luck, no kind of real abilities to be able to have someone who could speak a bit of English. And so we kind of just accepted defeat. We're like, well, this is it. You know, we, we biked around the place that our ancestors are from and there was no real big moment. And so I started Google mapping on my sister's phone a bike route out of it. And I go, hey, there's an English language school here. We should go check it out. And so we like bike over to this English language school and it's kind of in this duplex building and it's all boarded up. It says like, co like COVID, no lessons. And my sister's like, oh, well. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna knock. And she's like, mm, I don't know about that. Like, this is COVID, you don't just knock on people's house. I'm like, but well, when are we ever gonna be in Sunagawa again? And so I go knock on this door. Right away, huge regret. This lady comes down and she doesn't even open the door. She just cracks the window open with, you know, masks, face shield, glasses and say, Nani, like, what do you want? And I, I felt, I felt terrible right off the bat, but I was like, Sumi Masen, like, excuse me. Like our, 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 our great grandpa was from this area. We're from Vancouver. Uh, and we we're just hoping someone would be able to help us translate and potentially get a tour of the town. And she actually, I found it kind of funny because she lifts up her, her face shield and goes, get out. I'm from Vancouver. And she <laughs> says, come back in 10 minutes and I'll let you in. And meanwhile, my sister has almost like gotten onto her bike because she's like, this lady is mad. <laughs> and so anyways, we, we circle back in 10 minutes and come over and it turns out that she moved to Japan when she was 18, 19 years old to teach English in Tokyo. And she met this guy in Sunagawa and they fell in love and she moved to Sunagawa and she'd been living there the last 30 years teaching English. And she was originally from Mission. And so anyways, she was just so happy to have someone uh, talk to talk to in English. So I think we were there for an hour and maybe got in two words because it was just nonstop. Uh, and uh, anyways, we finally get a chance to say a few words and I'm like, okay, like, any chances the Sunaharas are still here? And she's like, oh, you know, I like teach all the kids here, but like, I can't, you know, that name just doesn't ring a bell. And it was another one of those moments where like, ah, so close. But she's like, I'll call my husband. So she goes and calls her husband. And um, he, he said he's going to look something up and call her back. And the phone rings, she goes over, picks it up. And she kind of yells out from the kitchen. She's like, he knows them. Then he goes, they know who you guys are. And then he goes, they live one block away. <laughs> they want to have you over for dinner. And we're like, holy smoke. So we ask her, we're like, please, can you join us? Because we are absolutely helpless without a translator. She goes, no problem. And we walk over literally one block from this English language school. And it's this old farmhouse um, on this like kind of farming plot. I think they were growing cantaloupe, big uh, fields of cantaloupe at the time. And we get to this house and we open up the door and I just remember me and my sister's jaw dropped because here was someone, exact same height as my grandma, exact same hair with a mustache, of course, because it was a guy, but we were like, <laughs> we are related to these guys. <laughs> and then they, sh they take us inside the house and they take us to this, this beautiful room to Tommy Matt floors. And th they knew the connection to Canada, even though it was a few generations ago. So they wanted to treat us. And so they had this whole room set up with takeout Chinese food, which just happens to be my grandma's favorite food. So again, me and my sister look at each other. We're like, we got to be related to these guys. <laughs> and they pull out. So it's a whole three generations that still live in this house. And they pull out this cedar plank. And the translator helps us explain it's the Sunahara. Our last name means the farmers of Sandy Field, because it's the sandy part of Kumamoto where they used to always uh, farm. And he's kind of going through the family tree. And then he goes, this is my grandpa. And then he says, this is your great grandpa. And it basically said he went to Canada. We didn't quite know what happened after that. And we were sitting in the very house that he would have grown up in until he was 18 uh, before taking the trip to Canada. 
And so <laughs> it was absolutely wild. And yeah. I just think, you know, our ancestors must have been looking over us and helping create that, that uh, experience. What a story. Do you have a question, Mina, or I got Yes, I actually, I do. Um, it, it reminds me so much of uh, last week, uh, the Grant family went back to their father's uh, hometown in China, this little village, and how they met uh, relatives uh, that looked so much like their <laughs> grandfather and uh, or their father, uh, and uh, that he was the uncle. Um, uh, and, and the family still kept the family clan book of 17, 17 generations and they saw their name and their children's name on the book, like a recording. I don't know mm -hmm. whether in Japanese, Japanese culture, whether mm -hmm. you record the ancestry and uh, that lineage. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Well, I think farther back that these are illiterate farmers and uh, uh, well, I'll try to find a picture of the cedar plank here and I'll post it in the chat. Yeah. It'll probably just take me a minute here. It, it's the experience of immigrants uh, coming, uh, leaving their hometown, coming to a new country, often uh, they don't know the, the culture, the language, uh, but they come for new opportunities uh, for supporting their family back home often. And uh, I know that during the Chinese, uh, um, early the, pine, uh, the, the uh, early Chinese that came to Canada, that uh, experience not, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, Chinese head tax. Uh, and uh, it eventually in 1903, it add up to $500. Oh, there you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, oh, wow. the, there's the Chinese food too. Wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. Mm. And there's a cedar plank. Yeah, mm. so each of those are different generations, I guess. You mm. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, I, uh, um, my question, uh -huh, I, I have to ask, uh, to follow up uh, just before uh, the session started, people were asking, and I'm going to ask you again, because I want other people to hear that story. Uh, of uh, your experience with avalanche <laughs> and life-threatening situations <laughs> that you experience in your life. And the, the last one is I might as well ask, how many bones have you broken so far? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you like adrenaline as much as me, you break a few bones along the way. <laughs> but I think... Um, well, it was really neat to like think actually just tying it back to that story I just told because it was interesting to learn that like our great great our great grandpa would have been uh, one of the younger ones in that family. And it was the oldest who was most responsible for the farm. And what happened was a lot of people were moving away from Kumamoto because they were having a really bad um, economic recession. Uh, and a lot of the places were really struggling. Um, and so the oldest child was responsible for the family affairs. A lot of the times they were forced to go overseas to send money back for the family. Uh, but what happened when, was it was interesting about learning about our great grandpa because he didn't ha technically have to go because he was younger and not responsible to the farm, but he was about 18, 19 years old and he went out of a sense of adventure. And so it's, this, it's really neat to see that kind of be passed on when I think about how adventurous my mom is and my sister is and I am and my grandma um, through the generations. Um, yeah, I guess, the, or sorry, I got away from the question there, avalanche experiences. Um, yeah, we had a pretty uh, intense avalanche experience earlier this winter. Uh, I live up north in the small town called Isket, which is in Taltan territory. And, you know, there's not too many people who ski and snowboard up here. So it's a lot different when you go into the back country. Um, there is no like snow reports or anything. So it's a lot, it is for sure more dangerous and out there. Um, and we were, me and my partner were in a very big avalanche um, in February of this year um, that took us pretty far down the mountain and dislocated my partner's shoulder, uh, but also we felt really grateful to have made it out of it and uh, be here today. 
And how many yeah, bones? How many bones? And how many bones I've broken? broken? Well, I, I always like to tell the story. I don't know if maybe my mom's told it to you before, but at one point when we were growing up, so me and my sister are both adventurous, and I think she got slide tackled in hockey or soccer or something. So she's got a busted ankle. She's in crutches. A week after that, I hit this snowboard jump and I overshoot it and I land on one side, bounce, hit the other side, and I break both my shoulders. So I'm in a double sling. And my dad at the time is working overseas. And my mom goes, you got to come home right now and help out with the kids. And so he comes home and obviously, you know, he gets home. He wants to go do some fun things. And he decides to go rollerblading. And I don't know if you guys remember the Seymour demo for us from back in the day when it had that really big hill that people would take off their rollerblades to go down. Well, he started to go down that and he got lock knee and he went straight down to the bottom and hit that bridge uh, and broke his tibia and his fibia. And so now you have me with the double sling, my sister with the crutches and my dad in a wheelchair. <laughs> I just think that was uh, par for the course with a family that loved adventure in the extreme. Oh. I, I worried that I just looked like the worst mother in the world. <laughs> I like when they uh, when you took us out grocery shopping and I think the cashier asked, oh, it's so great you're helping out folks from the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we should uh, open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you want, um, oh, Mina, you're. Yeah, I have one question uh, I would oh, yeah. like to ask. Uh, Tamo, you mentioned that about uh, your, uh, the women in your family uh, that uh, um, seem to be very uh, adventurous uh, because the Japanese women in, uh, in, uh, has been perceived kind of a passive, demure, and uh, um, uh, in popular cultures, especially um, Puccini's Madame Butterfly, you know, that. Uh, um, so your, the women seem to be, in your family at least, they seem to break that uh, stereotype. Could you maybe describe them to us a little bit and, and help us to understand what they are like uh, in the, the society? I'm sure expecting them to behave differently. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like it was interesting actually to be in Kumamoto and be learning about our family side. And, you know, there is those stereotypes of like, you know, Japanese women being passive and whatnot. But this, there's this amazing book called The Women of Kumamoto it kind of breaks that stereotype and says like, you know, the women in Kumamoto were strong. It was actually this anthropologist that came in and was studying Kumamoto culture and his wife came with him and his wife spent all the time with the Kumamoto women. And out of her diaries, this book was written about how, although his patriarchy couldn't see through that the power that women actually had within Kumamoto. And there's this amazing um, um, academic book actually about um, the power that, women had in, in Kumamoto. Um, and I just feel that's pa been passed on through the generations. You know, I think about my, my grandma may not be the adventurous sense in that she's climbing mountains and being swept away by avalanches, but in some ways, you know, she's incredibly resilient to have gone through what she went through in her life, you know, to raise, you know, ha Japanese children in a very racist time in Canada. And, you know, I think what I, what I always am moved by is like, I grew up on the west coast and i appreciate it so much and that was a byproduct of my grandma being strong because when they were all moved away from the west coast mm -hmm. during the internment camps there after the war ended they still weren't allowed moving out west and so a lot of them resettled in places like ontario uh and you know she out of her whole family the rest of the family stayed in ontario because they said why would we go back to to bc like they're really racist there uh but she was adamant and, and she even shared with me once you know it was almost like she still had some childhood memories that were rich from her place in Vancouver. And it was this, she loved the West coast that like adventure, mm -hmm. something outside, something that might not have been as comfortable. Um, and, you know, I feel like that, that it, surviving what she did uh, and still having that sense of trying something new, I think is incredibly adventurous. And you guys all know my mom, she's a crazy adventurer. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I feel very lucky to be in a family with, with uh, really strong women throughout the generations. Thank you. Tamiko, should we open up our microphone, our questions uh, to our participants? 
Right, Cindy, have you been keeping track? I'm all ready to go. Just waiting to tell you two did your, your questions. Go for it. Okay, so I've got a number of questions in the chat. And um, if people feel they really want to uh, unmute themselves and say more about it or whatever, you know, you can do that. Uh, but I'm going to read it out for now since you've put it in the chat. Um, but let me know if you want to do that. So my first question is from Catherine Hembling. And she says, has your experience in Japan given you a different idea about ancestry? And then she puts the, the power of out of sight. I'm not 100% sure what she means by that, but she can come on and tell us if she wants. But uh, the main question is, has your experience of Japan given you a different idea about ancestry? Uh, for sure. It, it's interesting because, I mean, throughout the film, you know, you get to experience where, you know, because of, obviously the racism I dealt with is a lot tuned down compared to what my mom had to deal with in school or even worse, like what my grandparents dealt with. But at the same time, it created like a lot of shame inside me and like just wishing so badly I wasn't Japanese. Um, but then like through time and as the film explains and through meet, meeting people, uh, specifically like communities like this that were reclaiming um, their culture and their identity, it made me really proud to like reclaim that being Japanese Canadian, like, yes, that's my ancestry. And then it was funny because you think going to Japan would further that. But me and my sister talked about you go to Japan and you realize, well, I'm not really Japanese either. <laughs> because it felt like being in a completely different culture and world. Um, so, I mean, I would love to say a story where like it like, you know, it completely like, you know, I, I found myself in Japan. But the truth is it just made me more confused about identity and, and my own, uh, how I identify and how I carry myself. And, and but I think I've always tr had to kind of deal with that, especially being mixed race, where it's just like, you're, you're not just Japanese, you're not, you know, and, and you're not just Chilean, and you're kind of this mix of everything. And, and as we explored that subject, because um, I mean, me and my sister were biking across Japan for four or five months, uh, we really dove into that and, and said, like, you know, these aren't these the silos that you're, you're stuck in and you can take what is like rich and important from that side uh, and, and feed that part of you, uh, but you don't have to take all of it. And sometimes it's important to break like the molds and the, the stereotypes around it. Like we were talking about earlier with those stereotypes around, around Japanese women and, and uh, that, you know, they're not true all the time. And, and um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of a roundabout ways of how I'd answer that. Good, lovely. Um, I've got another question from Carl Perrin, and he says, how did you meet the indigenous Ainu people? Uh, they looked almost professional with their costume and music. <laughs> how are they doing vis-a-vis -vis the dominant Japanese culture? Yeah, for sure. That was one of the coolest experiences, for sure, in Japan. Um, we were able to connect with the, they pronounce it Ainu in Japan, and they're the indigenous people of Hokkaido. Uh, and so there's indigenous people in the north of Japan as well in the south. A lot of them were moved out because of the colonization within Japan um, of the central island. Uh, and the northern Ainu we were able to connect with because my grandpa worked with, um, you saw one of the dancers, the main dancer, the one who was on the left. I don't know. If, but anyways, um, his, our, both our grandparents worked together really hard um fighting against the Nibutani Dam which was damming up the Nibutani River uh which was one of the last free-flowing uh rivers in northern Hokkaido uh with salmon uh and the Ainu who had been moved out of the estuary for industry and the impacts of colonization and had, had moved up into the kind of wouldn't say it was quite the headwaters but further up in the river built a lot of their sacred sites there uh, were being displaced from this Nibutani Dam. So it was really this nexus between, you know, environmental impacts of this dam, but also like huge human rights violations. Um, and so because they worked together uh, on, that, uh, on that fighting that dam, uh, that's how the connection was made. Uh, and they had a really rich relationship from that experience. I know my grandpa uh, was able to organize uh, Indigenous folks from Haida Gwaii and can't remember from where else to be able to go and go visit the Ainu while they were fighting this dam. Uh, unfortunately, the dam was built uh, and had very big effects on, on the community. Uh, and at the same time, they launched a big court case when they were fighting the dam. 
Uh, and it was the very first court case in Japan that proved that the Ainu uh, still existed in Japan. So I feel like um, colonization within a framework that Japan is, you know, it portrays itself as extremely homogenous uh, can be in many ways, like even more violent and intense um, from what, you know, we were able to, you know, the stories we heard at least. Oh. Wow. And um, that song that they sang was really special because we, we didn't even mean to, but we timed it up with the I Knew New Year's, which is kind of third week of January. Um, and they were, they had just been uh, in the midst of doing a bunch of uh, really special ceremonies around the coming of the new season. Uh, and so they offered up that song uh, kind of as a gift of thank you uh, to my, our, our family uh, for their support in, it would have been the seventies and eighties, um, trying to stop that dam. Wow. Beautiful story. Wow. Um, the next story, I, uh, the next question I have is from Diane Brown. And she would like to know is, uh, this like you did for your dad and one grandfather, will you be making a film about your mom and a grandfather, grandmother? <laughs> I wonder if that's Diane Brown from Heidegger, I have to ask. <laughs> Same name. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually did. It was really nice, actually, because after I came home from Japan, you know, that was something that, like, I really thought about um, a lot when we were doing this film, because, you know, specifically, CBC wanted my grandpa in it. Uh, and it was, you know, I navigated that because obviously that's how they would get on board with, and that was one of the main points of why they wanted it, but I struggled with it too, uh, because there are so many family members that make up influences on me, you know, like I was saying, my grandma was, you know, there even a lot more than my grandpa in some ways. Um, and so, you know, when I got back from Japan, I ended up spending a lot of time in Vancouver with my grandma, which was such a blessing uh, a COVID blessing to be, you know, to, to have that downtime with our elders. Uh, and in that time, you know, she was willing to do like a really special interview together. Uh, and it was such a, an incredible story that I got to hear from that, you know, film is such an interesting thing to me. It's like, it's, it's been this, I would say this passport to be able to ask questions sometimes of, of elders or family members that maybe you wouldn't have been able to ask if the camera wasn't there. You know, it allows you to probe a little deeper and you almost have this protection of this camera. And so, you know, we had this incredible interview that I hope to, you know, share and work with one day, but she said, I'm not allowed sharing it until she passes on. So, <laughs> and, I, and that's that, uh, the different kind of strength. And so, uh, yeah, I, I hope to um, for sure one day. Beautiful story, wow. <laughs> Um, then I'm going to uh, ask, uh, allow Rob to unmute himself. He has a question that he wanted to ask in person. So go ahead, Rob, Dino. There, did we lose him? Let me check. Rob. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It took me a while to navigate. So <laughs> no problem. just checking to see if you were still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I am clicking away madly. So, <laughs> thanks, Cindy. And hi, Tamu. It's great to see you and great to hear all your stories. And, and it was nice to revisit your film, which I've seen before, but I was happy to watch it again. Um, one of the things that struck me when watching the film today, which I don't remember from last time, is your what I think was your observation that you didn't think so much about finding your kind of exploring your roots and so on until you connected with indigenous people and you saw the ways in which their connections to their roots are so important and formative. Um, so if I understood that correctly in the script of that film, I'm interested in if you can just kind of tell us a little bit more about, about how that connection happened and, and, and if that's an important part of how you have been and continue to maintain your connection with all the indigenous and first nations people around here. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Rob. Uh, it's awesome to see you. Um, yeah, I feel like, 
Yeah, that was a really, I felt like it was a really important, you know, you, you have a 12 minute film, you got to be really selective, which, which words you use. Um, but that was one I really pushed for because it's, it's so true. Like without the experiences I've had in places like Iskit, Kinkum, Muller Bay, Haidegwai, I might not have been taking that journey back to Japan. And, and I think that, you know, that speaks to two different things. For one, it speaks to the, you know, the, the intensity and the scars that racism can have on us, that it can make us actually fully want to shed away from, from where we're from and our histories. Uh, but at the same time, it speaks to the power of resilience and how in some ways it can be almost contagious. Because for me, you know, in, in my environmental pursuits, it drew me into these communities where I now live and spend a lot of time. And, uh, and it was really in meeting a lot of, you know, who have now have become really good friends of mine and thinking about how they were working so hard to fight to keep their languages alive, to keep their songs alive, to keep their stories and their land protected. And, and it made me think like, how could I, you know, just suddenly shun this whole side of me, like generate, like it's in my DNA just because of, you know, a few experiences when I was a kid. Um, and it, it, it gave me, I guess, the, the strength to look, look, look into it. Uh, when you think about how many generations of assimilation and colonization are happening here, yet there's still this resilience. And, and that was inspiring and in that, you know, um, yeah, I, I feel like that was, um, it was an important, like, part of uh, why I went back to Japan and, and um, why we did Ritsu. Great. Thanks. So, so in a way, one of your gifts from the First Nations that you've connected with has been to inspire you to go and, and actually look and follow your own roots and make your own connections to your own history. Yeah, 100%. And almost like, I wouldn't say it was ever like explicitly said, but in some of the conversations, you know, you always get asked to introduce yourself in communities like this, small indigenous communities. And so it really was like constantly that being brought up that made me maybe ask those questions in myself. Because um, sometimes in like a, Canadian context you don't always have to answer that uh, but actually you know there's a lot of richness um, to asking those questions and looking into that um, yeah great great thanks okay I have another question um, uh, Catherine would like to know is there a useful oh, place that... Cindy I yeah think Paul's got his hand up Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think Catherine might have beat me by a, by a few moments. I think she was. <laughs> that's fine. Either way is good. Okay, I guess since I'm, I'm unmuted, um, you touched <laughs> on this, uh, uh, Tamo, about um, uh, connections between environmentalism here and there. When, when you visited, did you make any connections or do you, do you have any connections to, to the environmental movement in Japan and, and any opinion, any observations of how it is similar or different than, than here? Yeah, for sure. Great um, questions. Good to see you, Paul. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, with both me and my sister's values, we were like super keen to ask those type of questions in different communities as we were going along. But the language barrier was really hard and definitely limited our the depth of understanding in a lot of places. I mean, we did go to places like Minamata to learn about like what happened there uh, with the mercury poisoning and the effects on the community. Uh, one of the phenomenons that was like, unfortunately, very prevalent throughout our time in the Southern Island was the amount of uh, internal refugees uh, that have been moved away because of the Fukushima disaster. Uh, and so what happened was after the Fukushima disaster, radiation was 40 times higher than the allowable limit in the Fukushima area. Um, yet the government just kept upping the allowable limit to allow for, you know, work to continue. Uh, and a lot of, you know, there's so much, I would say, um, identity is like your job and your work as a, as a, this is like just stories we were told, but like as a man in Japan, like your identity is so tied up in your career and your job there uh, that they just would not leave Fukushima. But all these women were saying, this is our children we're raising in this. And so there was this huge outflow of women and children that took their families away from Fukushima to move to the south. And it, it was, you know, it was that's 
that speaks to like the power of the uh, those women again. Uh, but it was also like a, a tragedy to see that throughout our trip and see that throughout Kyushu, to see that throughout the south of the main island of Honshu uh, and in Amami. Um, but at the same time, one of the beautiful things in that we met this one, we spent three and a half weeks in this small town called Ichiki. Uh, and that was made up a really small town. They're having this huge uh, issue with, um, I guess like the population is aging a lot and not a lot of kid, uh, folks are having kids. And so they have this real uh, demographic that's skewed. And so a lot of that affects rural areas because rural areas stop having that younger population. Uh, but this Ichiki place was basically like revamped because of women and children that have moved away from the Fukushima area. And they were doing some really progressive environmental education there, uh, uh, obviously stemming from their experience uh, in Fukushima. And there was definitely some really inspiring outdoor ed uh, work that was happening there. We ended up, it was funny, they found out that we, me and my sister both work with kids here in, uh, in Canada. And so they had us working with the kids there, but it was pretty hard when you don't speak the language to work but it was great it just spoke to the power we ended up spending yeah I think we did like a we were doing camping overnight little surf lessons and stuff like that and and it, it speaks to that the language of of play and fun can translate um through and then in the island we were stuck further south in Amami for two and a half months during COVID um that's an indigenous island as well um and they, it is the one of the most intact coral reefs in Japan still to this day in that area. Uh, and that's directly from the stewardship of the Amami people. And so you're seeing similar trends. And that's where, you know, the environment can't just be this thing on the on its own outside of us. Like it's very much our like relationship to it. And that's where, you know, when you think about sustainability, the only communities that have a track record of thousands of years of restorative economy is indigenous communities. Therefore, how do we support the healing uh, from the colonization? Uh, and I think that's just as important of an environmental battle as, as any other one, uh, because you're fighting for this idea, or I would say almost this, this value of how we relate to place. Thanks. Wow. I think I'm going to take my cue from Tomiko and just take first questions from more people before I go to second ones from the same person. So uh, Megumi asks, uh, Tutamo, do you know the Japanese children's folktale, Ur Urushima Taro? I'm probably not sure. Ura Urashima Taro. Thank you, Megumi. I don't, but I would love to hear it. <laughs> um, it's a, a folktale for the kids. Um, because you said you and your sister visit uh, Amami Oshima. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that. And then, uh, anyway, this is a story about a, a young fisherman. Um, he uh, fishes, catches fish, right? But one day when he was at the beach, he saw uh, various kids. They are really giving um, really a bad time to the um, young turtle. So he went and told the kids, stop um, harassing the um, baby turtle, you know. So then he let this uh, tiny uh, young turtle into the uh, ocean. Then, uh, I don't know how many years later, but one day he was fishing and he saw that big turtle approach to him, he said, uh, Urashima Taro-san, no, that's his name, uh, Taro Urashima. Oh, thank you so much. I'm the, the baby turtle you saved me. In order to repay uh, that, uh, I want to take you to Ryugujo. Uh, Ryugujo is like an under, um, under the water palace. So uh, hop on my back, you know, so he did. Then uh, turtle, I took Urashima Taro to the uh, sea palace. And that's where it's beautiful uh, ladies and the princess mm -hmm. there, they just gave um, him best you know, um, treatment, uh, food and the dance and best thing, you know, a time he can, uh, anybody can dream of. So he stayed, but then uh, they passed and then said, 
uh, he thought himself, oh, I think I better get home, you know. So he told the uh, princess, our well, queen or princess, uh, thank you so much. Uh, what a great uh, treatment, uh, but I have to go back to my home. So she said, oh, that's too bad. We want you to stay here long, um, many, many time, a uh, long time, but uh, I, I guess you have to go home. Then uh, I have a little present for you. And she brought a beautiful box and then I gave it to him. Then to she told me, uh, but one thing I give you advice, please don't open the box. <laughs> so anyway, so then he um, said goodbye. Thanks so much. You know, so Tatar took him back to the beach, you know, his home village. So when he arrived, his home village, um, beach, then he looked around and the people passing by, he didn't recognize any of them, none of them. He, he was just look around, but he tried to find his home. He couldn't find his home. He was so discouraged and so sad. What happened? I was away just a few days, you know. What happened to my people? What happened to my village? Then he was really um, depressed that he was sitting by the beach and then all of a sudden, all oh, right, here's a beautiful uh, box. Um, um, a queen of um, princess, you know, under water, gave me Otohime Sama, that's the name of the Japanese, you know, uh, princess of the uh, deep uh, ocean, I guess. Um, yeah, he said, uh, don't open it. But then he was so lonely, so depressed, sad. He said, yeah, but I want to see what's inside. So he opened it. Then here's a puff, you know, white crowd came out from the box. Then all of a sudden, his uh, black hair turned to white. Then he had a mustache, it's all turned to white. That's the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking. I remember that like, story. Yeah, then he, uh, story. it's a, like a, he had a sort of time trip, right? Yeah. And then when you mentioned your uh, grandfather, great grandfather, uh, when uh, left his hometown uh, village uh, when he was 16, 17, somewhere to Canada, then uh, people back home, they never knew what happened to him, right? So I was thinking about you know, your grand, great great um, grandfather, is like Urashima Taro, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> That's Thank a reminds me, yeah, Urashima Taro's tale. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wonderful. That was beautiful. That was uh, our evening complete with a Japanese true storytelling. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> A folk tale. Uh, I'm going to go to Elizabeth's question now. Uh, she says, Tamil, have you shared Rutsu with your family members' connections in Japan? And if so, what has been their response? Yeah, I have. Um, I was able, actually, my grandma's roommate and then my friend Mayumi helped translate it. Uh, so there's Japanese subtitles because that was actually something I really wanted to do, uh, was to share it with a uh, family over there, as well as the Ainu, um, Taichi, and Koizawa, and the folks who were uh, in the film. Um, so yeah, they were, they loved it. <laughs> yeah, they thought it was, they thought it was a really interesting take. Um, yeah. The question. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to go to. I'm just trying to change the mute here so we can maybe get this this different picture showing. Um, the next question, sorry, is uh, from Catherine, and uh, she would like to know: <laughs> Is there a useful place in Iskit for tourist activists this summer? <laughs> Another adventurer. <laughs> 
it's so hard to tell the future right now what could happen in a few weeks um they've been actually on the community here is one of three tall tan communities um and they've had zero cases of covid knock wood uh because right away they prioritized their elders and their communities and they went into like a very strict lockdown um that actually just got lifted this week but it had been in effect since covid came to canada um and they've been able to keep everyone safe but they're also um pretty strict about things uh so i don't know if this summer things will be opening up your best bet is to check kind of the um, the tall Ten central government puts out news releases about what their latest COVID rules are. Um, but yeah, one of the, the ISCA community did just buy, um, an area just south of their territory, uh, sorry, just south of the village here that they want to set up as like a kind of ecotourism, um, RV park or something. It's kind of just, they got the land right now and they're still brainstorming it. So there's definitely going to be opportunities in the future. Um, but yeah, right now it's such a, the tricky time <laughs> to think about visiting but yeah I think like you know it's one of the places where I mean my mom could probably talk to it too like they really some of the most generous open-armed um people I've met in my life and and I'm sure they would take people in and love to meet them down the line here when it's safe to do so a lot of the people here are from the environment team as you know and so they're very aware of the sacred headwaters, they've heard of that, and red Chris mines and um, fortune minerals. And so do you want to update them a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Like I remember, because I guess the, the community here in Iskit, uh, a bunch of the elders started fighting for the land in 2004. Uh, and that's when Shell Canada had this huge tenure. They were going to do a bunch of coal bed methane extraction in the sacred headwaters. And I think they still, I don't know, there was a, there was a big petition, I remember, and a letter actually signed by the Unitarians in Vancouver that went up. And I know, I think it's somewhere kicking around Rhoda, who's one of the key organizers who, uh, her house here, I remember seeing that actually once at her house. Um, and so that just speaks to, you know, I know you guys have done so much amazing solidarity work, not just for the Kiwana Keepers, but, you know, for groups up and down the coast. And, and, you know, just the fact that, of all the things that happened in that campaign that, you know, she kept those letters. Uh, it speaks to the work you're doing that, you know, people directly feel that support, even if it's thousands of kilometers away. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of my hats off to the work you guys are doing and working on so many different issues uh, and supporting small towns that, you know, don't quite have the same access to, to media and the, the towers of power that uh, we, we can have in, in urban centers and obviously a place like Vancouver. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm going to go now to Nina's question. Um, she would like to know, when you're standing at the mountaintop with your ski board and then slicing down the mountain, <laughs> very poetic to me, what were you feeling? <laughs> oh, oh, that's a hard thing to describe. <laughs> Pure bliss. Uh, I always think of it okay, who, someone compared it to the idea of like it's almost like you're painting this canvas um, you know nature puts out this like fresh canvas of fresh snow and and you get to kind of put these lines through it and 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 flow down and and just fly and I, th I think we've all wanted to pretend we were a bird and fly and I think snowboarding can be pretty close to that feeling uh. <laughs> One thing I noticed was when you were little from the film that you were falling and you were seem to, you want to go fast and then you always seem to be very adventurous <laughs> and then you just want to push yourself. <laughs> and then when I saw you on the mountain top coming down the mountain, it's like a, you are just, it, the Chinese, we say that at three years old, it determines uh, the, the, the child's future. And then a family used to present to the child at three years old, a plate. And on the plate, it will have different objects and that will reflect the child's future. And I certainly saw from the film that when you're a little and how that reflect you as an adult. <laughs> I don't know whether your mother would agree with that observation or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did like the adrenaline rush, but at the same time, he had this amazing ability to sit still, to watch insects and birds and nature, which most kids, they can't sit still like that. So it's quite a combination, those two things. Wow. 
Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to Cynthia's question next. She said, uh, now I'm just going to do a little touch on the time. It's 8.02 right now. And I understand that the idea is that if everyone is willing, especially you, Tamil, will go to 8.30. Is that correct, Tamiko? Just for anybody that needs to leave uh, at 8 o'clock, I'm just acknowledging that it's 8.02. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to um, Cynthia Lamb. You mentioned you're working on a master program. What would be future aspirations? <laughs> Oh, that master's is for mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a little tricky to be back in school for the first time in like 11 years. But uh, it, it feels it feels like a really it's a special program. And just the ability to be able to go to school from anywhere is kind of a real privilege right now, because obviously, um, you know, it was talked about earlier, like I feel like, you know, I put really deep relationships and roots into this town of Biscuit. Uh, and I love it here and I love coming back, keeping those relationships going. Um, and, you know, there's no university near here, uh, but obviously COVID was this opening to be able to do a, um, a program um, online. Although it's on Eastern time and I keep signing up for classes, forgetting that it's on Eastern time. So I got a lovely 6 a.m. class right now. <laughs> but it, no, it's been, it, it's been pretty neat for sure. My focus is on uh, environmental education, as well as impact producing films. So the idea that like documentaries are great, but unless you have strong strategies of like, what is the goals of your documentary? Who, how do you use your documentary as a tool uh, to support existing organizations that work on the, those issues? Um, that's when you can really make magic with films rather than it just being entertainment. So yeah, it's been, it's been different to go to school. But <laughs> it's been fun, <laughs> well, sometimes Young men have to do something for their mom. Yeah. <laughs> that goes best for you in one way, right? A little piece hanging. Yeah. And that sounds like an absolutely perfect fit. That program you just described. I, I can't think of it. It's like custom made like a suit for from a tailor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and then um, I should say it's also spurred your sister on to want to do her master's too. So that's great. <laughs> wow, even better. Um, uh, you made me think of one question in what you said is the, uh, about how you like to keep connections. And I'm wondering, are, are there going to be future connections with the family you met in Japan in your future that you see? Yeah, for sure. Well, we ended up staying in that, their house, the, the, the one I told the story about earlier. We ended up staying there for four days. Unfortunately, our friend uh, Lisa, I think it was her name, the translator, obviously had to go back to work and do her own thing. So once she was gone, it was it was really hard, but awesome. We spent four days not being able to talk, but just having that connection of like being family. And it was funny because we would, you know, you'd kind of be doing hand signals for a while and then eventually you just go family and we'd all hug. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the younger, there was a younger, um, she was kind of like, I think she was, Wenny, her name was Haju, who would have been like our long lost cousin type thing. Uh, my sister's been keeping really close touch with her on Instagram. Uh, and her goal is to try to come out and visit one day, uh, which I think would be really special. Um, the other ones are very just rooted on their farm, uh, which, which has its beauty as well. Yeah. Wow. And do you see yourself going back to Japan again at any point? In the I would year? love to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think our next, we kind of schemed up our next mission, and I think it's going to be uh, to connect with a Chilean family. And yeah. So we kind of have this big dream, actually, of doing a, we want to kind of um, bicycle the Atacama Desert, and then ski tour the Andes, and then see kayak down the south of Chile. <laughs> <laughs> I don't what know if I told you that yet, Mom. No, you haven't, I haven't heard about this that. Is, this is me and my sisters, like, we're starting to brainstorm this project two years from now. So. <laughs> but I feel so lucky to have, like, a sibling to be able to uh, do these adventures with. And, yeah. Two peas from the same pod. <laughs> yeah, not many Chilean... Uh, Japanese people I can go around and adventure with so <laughs> <laughs> so does that plan surprise you Tomiko <laughs> not really no. no I didn't think so <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to come on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um 
I'm not seeing any more questions unless I've missed anything here. And I don't think I see any more hands up, but I'm sure people could probably come up. I know I could come up with 100 questions in three minutes. So go ahead and put your hands Tamiko, up. Tamiko, uh, um, sorry, Megumi has uh, her hands up. Uh, yeah. Oh, OK, sorry. Yeah. For some reason I couldn't get to oh, so, Sorry, just a little bit. It's a little bit serious, not a folk tale, but um, because you mentioned about the Fukushima uh, Genpatsu and people still, um, uh, quite a few people still cannot go back, go home. Um, then recently Japanese government decided to, uh, they have a so much uh, dirty water uh, store, then they are coming to the really limit, right? So they have to do either they uh, um, let it go to the ocean or air. Then uh, they had a really asked um, people you know, specializing you know, and committee, I think. So uh, it, it's not you know, like a spur of a moment a decision, but they really, really came to the uh, deadline. So they have to do something. So they are, um, Conclusion is uh, yes, uh, we let to those dirty water in the ocean, right? But you know, <laughs> to my reactions, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, right away, I can see like a uh, activist over here, environmental activist, or in um, the other side of the uh, Pacific Ocean, which is Canada, uh, opposed, right? <laughs> so anyway. Um, and I, I'm sure you be uh, you know and uh, you, you know much better than I do. You are so informed. I'm so impressed how knowledgeable you are from the south Okinawa, uh, Amami Oshima to all the way to Hokkaido. You know, I'm so impressed. You know, <laughs> so I just want to um, like to know what you are uh, thinking. So that's my little question, I guess. For you yeah. yeah i found that pretty hard that was totally the conversation that was happening when we were there with what to do with this nuclear waste that was adding up and it was it was pretty tragic when they made that decision to dump it start dumping it into the open ocean and there, it was interesting to see like we met quite a few like i guess it, activists in japan um but it's so interesting because they they would they told us they don't like to identify as activists there because there's mm -hmm. a lot of negative connotation around it. Um, I think they said partly because of just how the pressures of like a homo like uh, I would say like a because it isn't really homogenous but this like somewhat homogenous like mainstream culture there uh, that it puts pressure on people from like kind of speaking out like that. And so the people that do are extremely courageous. Um, and I remember we we met with some folks actually um who were organizing rallies around that issue uh of the of the nuclear waste in, in fukushima and yeah i would hope it's it's i would hope that it, there is some not just solidarity but outcry from the west coast here as well because it is that same ocean you know environmental problems aren't tied to national borders and they need like transnational solutions and like an almost an internationalist approach um and yeah, it was, yeah, it's, it's just lays heavy on my heart for sure, that issue. Um, um, you, you, did you hear about the uh, Japanese word gaiatsu? No. It's uh, uh, outside pressure from outside. See, like mm -hmm. a Japanese, you are saying like uh, they are great to environmentalists in Japan, but it's very hard for them to speak up because yeah. the, within the Japanese, you know, um, they have uh, so much you know, pressure, right? Uh, if you speak up, you'll be hammered down. You know? Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, Japanese history, even like a major restoration, you know, like a, a revolution that was 150 years ago, even though um, at, at that time, uh, Tokugawa shogunate, uh, they, they are so uh, not able to uh, deal with, you know, uh, what's happening you know, Western world uh, coming to Japan. Um, they knew 
what's happening in China, you know, so they know next is Japan, you know, but to talk about back uh, 250 years, you know, they are shogunate, they are just not able to cope with, you know. So mm. anyway, uh, then Peru came, went to Japan. So that was with the three big uh, ship, you know, steamship that really gave a shook, you know, Japanese, you know. So um, the revolution started. But point is, uh, Gayatsu, uh, Japanese people are, uh, when uh, pressure come from outside, then they really put together, you know, try to find the best solution, you know, good or bad, you know. But uh, without Gayatsu um, inside, they just go round, 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 mm. round, nothing happened, you know. So I'm wondering, you know, if you could be one of the, those, you know, um, um, gayatsu, uh, pressure from outside. Uh, you are in a safe position to do that. Um, you can help with the Japanese uh, uh, environmental activists, helping be becoming kind of like a gayatsu, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you are safe position to do that, to help your uh, friends in Japan, environmentalists in Japan. And that, that's my bit of opinion. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that is. I appreciate that. That's a gaiatsu, as you say, how you say it? Yeah, gaiatsu, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because it makes me think about like it's in, the, in that context of like, you know, how support outside sometimes helps validate voices that are speaking out um and like that's interesting and like the yeah we definitely see, saw that a bit in japan but i see that a ton here in iskit where like when you live in a small town and mm. when you know exploitive environmental projects like you know come in they divide the community like crazy because at the same time it's hard to find employment in a small remote community mm. um especially when you don't have access to your land through colonization and so what a lot of the times like a lot of folks have mentioned like when you're standing up you'll be the only person in your whole family that's wanting to fight for the sacred headwaters and so when you get that outside push of like hey people are caring about this in Vancouver or keep people are caring about this in Toronto you're getting those letters it, it, it helps you feel that almost that community feeling that is a lot easier to find in an urban setting where you can find enough people that have the same values as you uh, and are interested in the same thing and so that's why that that work of solidarity um, ends up being so vital, uh, like you were saying, for an internationalist work um, and also um, for urban, rural as well, I think. Just got to plug in the computer here. Look at that. It, it, it reminds me of when uh, the Unitarian, the Environment Committee, decided to hold a rally in front of Imperial Metals to protest the Mount Polly spill and also our fears about the Red Chris mine being put in up in Iskut. And uh, we got a response from the VP of the Imperial Medals within a couple of days of posting it on Facebook. And uh, Kanahus Manuel from the Sequekmik was like, what the hell? We've been trying to get hold of somebody from there for months and you post it and you get two days and you get a response. Oh. And, and then she was saying, and that's, that's your strength. You know, you are urban and you're non-indigenous and so you have mm -hmm. a lot of power and you need to use it you've got a voice mm -hmm. yeah 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 wow and now we know a japanese word for it <laughs> <laughs> the uh the story that you like uh, tamil just showed me his rough cut of his upcoming movie about the clavona keepers and the clip about that woman that was feeding fish that she caught in the lake to her kids because it's it's her it's her food, you know, that she can catch. And, and it turns out that there was a high selenium count and she realized that she had just poisoned her kids inadvertently. And it was just heartbreaking to see that. And so I just think about these, these mothers and their children and, you know, like fish is so important in the diet in Japan. And just the thought that it could be radiated, <laughs> radiation is just horrible. Yeah, for sure. Sorry. Uh, irony is you know, Fukushima, you know, people, uh, they are the victim, right? Mm. Um, because the um, Japanese government made a um, very good, um, like a place, um, structure, but tsunami, nobody um, predicted tsunami that scale. 
um, yeah. you know, that's a good uh, excuse, but it is uh, true. That's uh, um, once in southern years, size of a tsunami, some part 40 meter high tsunami attack, you know, um, not uh, everywhere, but point is, uh, it's like uh, Fukushima people, uh, because of the natural disaster and the human disaster, they, they became victim. But if the Japanese government to let in the water out into the ocean, then uh, fishermen, you know, took them 10 years rebuild, even still half of the uh, former, before the tsunami, you know, and, um, but throw the, you know, uh, dirty water, then again, and um, people don't stop buying, oh, dirty, you know, poison, you know, fish, you know. So you are, they'll become a victim again, you know, so it's really, really sad for the Fukushima people. So they need to, um, outside the voice, you know, pressure. Um, I, I think, you know, that uh, we can uh, do something, I guess, help them. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask uh, a question a little bit? Uh, I'm hearing that uh, Japan is colonial, but I wonder where its colonialism comes from because I don't think it came from England, which is what we usually think of as, as the source of colonialism. Could you give me a little bit of a really brief idea of the colonialism of Japan? Just a very simple. <laughs> <laughs> Samurai, you know, like uh, samurai took over the power um, 800 years ago. Um, at that, uh, 800 years ago, it was like an uh, emperor and those people, you know, uh, court, you know, people. Um, they took uh, care of managing all over Japan, but they become always power corrupt, right? So then uh, samurai starting, uh, samurai was like a, a guard dog, you know, for the emperor and those people at that time. But you know, they started getting more power. Then eventually they um, took over the power. Then Japan became a, like a um, samurai managed country, right? Then, um, but at the end, uh, like uh, Western world uh, went to um, Japan, tried to force Japan to open the uh, door, close the door for almost 300 years. So uh, Japan was forced to open the door to Western country, America, Europe, you know, power. And then when at that time, uh, where you are um, our grandmothers, you know, Kumamoto, Prefecture next to where I'm come from, but anyway, point is those support uh, out like outside the uh, shogunate power structure, but they are the one who really had a young and idealistic people. Like I, I think about like a Cuban um, revolution, you know, Castro and uh, you know those people. Uh, anyway, point is. And uh, they took over the eventually over uh, run uh, top of the Tokugawa Shogun in the last 250 years. But then Japanese people realized Japan was so behind, just like North Korea right now. They are close so, so many years, but you know, they really missed out the train. So uh, Meiji and, and government they, they are very uh, able, uh, young people became, you know, leadership. Then they thought, oh, we have to catch up with the Western world, you know. So they send young people to uh, America, England, France, Germany, you just name it. And then they learn all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, ideas, so on. But all, at the same time, <laughs> they learn Western, um, particularly from France, I think, how to control um, people. 
after get rid of samurai system, how do you keep Japan safe, right? So they learn from uh, France. Uh, France was really had the best uh, like uh, army in the world under the Napoleon. Um, so that's what uh, they learn. And uh, also not only France, but you know, England and Germany, I guess. But anyway, uh, at the same time, <laughs> Japan done colonialism. Uh, that was uh, what happening. Uh, England, France, Germany, you know, Spain, um, Denmark, you know. So they, they learn colonialism, you know, from Europe, you know, America, America too. So, so different from usually colonialism happened because of a takeover, but this was more from the people, the young people going and and bringing it home. Is that sort of how you're de describing it more? Not like an outside takeover, like being conquered, but being attracted to the pieces and creating your own colonial society. I wanted to ask <laughs> uh, a little bit more Tamil's views on it from, you know, uh, that's a wonderful history lesson. Thank you so much. That's more than I expected, but I kind of wanted to get his concept on it as an activist the yeah. responses to that version of colonialism. Yeah, for sure. I remember actually me and my sister were having a good laugh because was, as we learned some of that history uh, that you were alluding to, we're like, damn, we were kind of obsessed with samurais when we were younger, but they're really just the RCMP of Japan at the day, you know, enforcing <laughs> this imperial, almost protecting empire. And when we think of colonialism, um, you know, it is interwoven with empire and it's interwoven with imperialism and we still live in the shadows of it today. Um, it's just maybe not done by the state, but done by the corporations that have come out of who were once the elite. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, and, and there's no like denying that Japan has a very imperial relationship uh, with other countries as well, especially through Southeast Asia. Um, and so, you know, that, and that's one of those things that me and my sister talk about when we talk about like, you know, it's such a different relationship uh, being Japanese in Japan compared to being Japanese Canadian, because being Japanese in Japan, there's almost this superiority complex of like mm -hmm. being above those other um, Asian countries, whereas here it's the, um, I would say, you have the opposite effect uh, because of how people were treated during World War II. Uh, and it really showcases how, um, you know, race is, you know, it's used in certain ways um, uh, to, you know, control people uh, for the interests of, of the state uh, and for power and, and for empire. And, and um, like, I, and that's why it's so important when we talk about like all this, stuff around anti-racism that's growing. Like it's, this isn't an individual uh, issue we're dealing with it. We really have to be thinking about the systemic legacies of racism that we still live under as well. Um, but I don't know if that quite answered your question, but those are just things that brought up in my thoughts as we explore that issue. That's perfect. Uh, I'm gonna go to Cynthia and Anne, and then we're just about out of time. So uh, I have those two left to ask a question, Cynthia. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm just uh, very happy to hear that you are studying <laughs> the impact, <laughs> you know, the impact <laughs> filming, and uh, and also like uh, your mom was saying, you you were still working on the the upcoming film, uh, The Keeper, and then what she was uh, describing, you know, that the mothers are really having no other choice but feeding the children with whatever available that the mother know something's you know, it's poisonous. And this kind of thing, it's, of course, you know, it's heart wrenching, but also this is the fact that applies to many parts of the world now, even here, right? Yeah. We know the water is not clean and the, the soil is, uh, is very problematic uh, and a lot of cover up, you know, by the, by the mm. industry. So mm. I'm just asking, this, uh, this, the film that you're working on seems to be, uh, it could be used as such a powerful tool. And I'm just wondering, like you are the filmmaker and do you, I mean, in, to make it like a 
like high impact everything do you need to have like a special like a publicist or whatever to work as a team to make it really big that uh, we need to see it to be <laughs> yeah that's a great question um, well, my work right now, outside of those other things, is I work for an, orga an organization called Story Money Impact that actually just became a Canadian charity a few months ago. And their work revolves around basically studying this whole field of impact producing, which doesn't really exist in the Canadian film world. It exists in other places, like places like Columbia actually has a really progressive impact filmmaking sector. And that, that's that whole idea that like documentaries kind of have to be treated a little differently than normal films, especially when they're social justice or they're issue-based films, uh, because the strategy becomes so different. Like it's not always about everyone needs to see this and then they're changing their attitude. Sometimes it's specific people that hold a lot of power with that issue. Sometimes the film could be powerful for healing reasons and needs to see certain people. Um, and so it's interesting how it's almost like doesn't need like this whole like, um, I would say your traditional distributor producer, but it almost needs like a community organizer uh, that can navigate those relationships and those different fields uh, of people that are already working on that issue. Um, so for example, with this Cabana Keepers film that we have been co-producing with the community here about the elders and about their long fight for the sacred headwaters, uh, we partnered uh, with an impact producer, producer who was able to spend basically over a month researching all the organizations that already work on those issues of indigenous rights, of indigenous sovereignty, mm -hmm. of environmental protection, and bring them into a room with us to say like, this is all the work going on right now. This is this film that potentially could support the work you're doing, but you guys have been doing the work. So how can this film serve that, that, that issue? And I think that's really important to like have that um, the organization really preaches this humility around films because like obviously you can make a film about all sorts of issues but the likelihood that that issue existed before the film is probably pretty you're pretty sure of it and the likelihood that people have organized around that issue or is also very likely uh, and so how does your film complement that and kind of build off the wisdom the movement wisdom around that issue um, and I would say that's kind of what this story money impact group is exploring and it's really interesting stuff uh, all sorts of different films that they're exploring and if you're interested in that field they, they would be um something to look up um but thank you for that question wow that's fascinating um i have a number of acknowledgements and thank yous in the chat from various people and diane brown says camo thank you so much for your time and generosity mm -hmm. as a member of the ucb environment committee and a mom i am inspired mm -hmm. by your important creative work and as a huge fan I am looking forward to your next film. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. And then I have uh, one more final question from Anne. And uh, Anne, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Camel a question. Really fast. Yeah, really quick. We're kind of... <laughs> Can you guys hear a question directly to Camel? Can you hear me? Can't hear you very well. Can you really holler? Okay, I'm just going to turn up my um, volume. Okay. Know. How is this? Oh, yeah. better. That, that's good. Okay, I, I was just a bit alarmed when Cindy asked this question about colonialism and you were saying it was a British thing. And so I'm gonna say something controversial. Um, it has been said that Japan was influenced definitely by Europe, that it adopted this European fascist model in order to survive. But during World War II, Japan was allies with Italy and Germany and because there was so much overpopulation in Japan, they chose to attempt to colonize Korea, Manchuria, then all of China, and they went into Burma. So there needs to be some kind of clarity on factual issues here. And I don't mean to offend Tamo or Kamiko or Magumi, but there is this history of Japanese aggression and racism in China as well. Like there was something called um, the Nanking Massacre. The Japanese were brainwashed to see Chinese people as inferior, which is why they went in and massacred all these Chinese people. So this is off topic because we're talking about colonization and environment and warfare. But I, I had to bring this in because there's an issue of historical accuracy. 
Thank you. That's really excellent. We're, I'm getting way more history lesson here than I had actually expected. I appreciate it from uh, those of you who have an understanding of that culture. I was more looking for, uh, as an activist, um, Tamil's response to that and how it affects his work. But thank you all for adding more uh, from your various knowledge bases. Thanks so much. We're just about out of time. I think I'll pass the last words over to Tamiko. <laughs> to say her thing mm. and she'll pass it to someone else if I'm wrong. Thank you so much, Tamil. It's been fabulous. Yeah, that was great. Thank, thank, thank you, Tamil. That was wonderful. So this is the third of our four our four nights, film nights. Um, as we've already said, next week it'll be interesting because it's about humor, which is very it varies, depends on your lived experience. And so what one person thinks is humorous, someone else might think of as offensive. And so these ones were curated by the organizers of the Asian Heritage Month to say that we thought they were hilarious. So it'll be interesting if you go and view these things and think about what your reaction is. And if you don't like it, great, you gotta come and tell us why. And we'll tell you why what we think it's, it's funny. Um, so it'll be very interesting and I hope that you can make it then. Um, and thank you, Cindy and Paul for helping out. This is wonderful. Um, and my fellow organizers, Mina and Cynthia, Megumi. Yeah, it's been great. Mina? And uh, I just want to say that uh, don't forget to invite your friends, your neighbors, <laughs> your coworkers. Uh, and I'm sure next Friday is they're going to have a good laugh. Uh, mm. And uh, don't. Um, keep an open mind uh, and uh, just uh, so like uh, we also laugh at things that uh, we find it's a funny so yeah please do invite other people <laughs> there's no geographical limit too so I have friends from Montreal Toronto right yeah it's just good time yeah and we can uh, we can laugh at ourselves too that, that yes that's time. right <laughs> so don't worry <laughs> And thank you so much for everyone that uh, yeah. uh, and uh, for participating. And I wish you a good night. And thank you again, Tamil. And it's such a pleasure to have you tonight. Yeah, wow, uh, good. Thank you so much for organizing. It was a blast. Thank, yeah, you. thank, yeah, you. thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Good night. Take care, yeah. everyone. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. -bye. If you can yeah. join us next Friday, give us your generation kind of a view to the humor. <laughs> oh, for sure. I've seen some of those videos. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Take care, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye there. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good night.